I begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Indeed, all praise is due to Allah, for once more He has blessed us with this precious opportunity of getting together as Muslim youth and engaging in His remembrance. And I feel that if we really think about it, if we really reflect that the fact that Allah really wanted us to be here tonight, that we were brought here for a reason, that Allah wanted, wanted to hear from us, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to be with us. I feel that if we can really grasp that concept, we would have the highest levels of Iman, we would have the highest levels of faith. And with that being said, I always see this in this crowd as I see the majority of you guys returning uh, every week. And I believe that deserves a very loud salawat. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, by the way, the fan's not working. We're going to bring in a new fan. Sorry. It'll be here momentarily. Uh, tonight's lecture is going to be on fasting. You know, why is it that Allah has decreed for us to fast? And before I mention that, I want to briefly mention something that I took up on the last lecture, and that is that we are Muslim. Meaning, as Muslims, we are A, supposed to strive towards peace. And B, we're supposed to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we were talking about before the lecture with Brother Muhammad Jihad, we have to uh, follow Allah's orders. We have to uh, understand what Allah has decreed for, for us. We have to follow these, regardless of what they are. But a lot of times, some people come forth and say, you know, I don't like submitting. I want to be a free man. Why is it that I have to submit to something I can't see, something I can't hear, something I can't feel? What's the point of that? But then I, I'd like to ask that question to someone who proposes such a thing. They say, I say, you want to be a free man, right? You submit to no one, you submit to nothing. So whenever you're on an airplane, do you tell the pilot to step aside, I want to fly myself, wherever I want to go? You'll say, no, I don't know how to fly a plane. But you're submitting to the pilot, aren't you? You're putting your faith in that pilot, that he's going to take you from point A to point B. But for those of you who are having trouble with uh, understanding what I'm talking about, let's talk about something else. In math class, when you're sitting in math class, subject everyone loves, I'm sure, and a teacher is teaching, do you get up and then say, hey, I want to teach this class? Do you do that? No, I'm not a math teacher. But you're submitting to the teacher. The teacher is telling you to stay put, be quiet. If you have a question, you have to raise your hand. So if we notice, it's in our human nature to submit to a higher authority. Otherwise, we'd get no, uh, we wouldn't get anywhere. So whenever we say, I submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when I say, I, admit, I submit to a higher uh, being, I submit to the divine, you're going above everything else. And it's okay, it's completely okay to say, I submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These rules come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You didn't create yourself. Imagine if I gave birth to myself. Actually, don't imagine that, that's pretty messy. You didn't, you didn't create yourself. The universe didn't create itself. It had a creator. Therefore, you have to follow the guidelines set forth by the creator. And I'll use another analogy to top that off. When you're kids, you don't choose to go to school. Imagine a five-year-old picking up a book and going, Hey, mommy, I'm ready for kindergarten. You don't see that happening. You have to either bribe the kid, you have to beat him, God forbid. You have to do something to take him to school. He doesn't want to go, it's boring. His, he's not wise enough to do that. That's why wisdom dis dictates that the wise are supposed to make the decisions. Let's recite a loud salawat. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So with that being said, a lot of times people say, so what's the point of researching? Just like Brother Muhammad Jihad mentioned before, why should I look into the ahkam? You know, I'm a Muslim, I have to submit anyway, so what's the point? And Allah answers this very directly in uh, Surah Al-Araf, verse 184, where He says, Do they not reflect? There is no madness in their companion. And in companion, it means Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So Prophet Muhammad is just a plain warner, and it says in the end of the uh, he is nothing but a plain warner. He's not a madman. He didn't come forth with a bunch of rules. He didn't tell you randomly to fast. So that's why in the beginning of the ayah it says, "Awalam Do they not reflect? Do they not think about this? This religion was not brought forth by a man. This religion was a guideline set forth for you to go through life in the best way. And we talked about previously that Islam is a religion. By definition, it means peace. But in what sense? Peace for the body, peace for the mind, and peace for the soul. 
And tonight we're going to be talking about fasting. Why is it that Muslim fast? You know, a lot of times uh, we ask why we're so practical. And fasting in the holy month of Ramadan is what Muslims are known for. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 183, Allah says, O oh, oh you who believe, fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you so that you may become pious and guard yourselves. So who is it referring to when it says it was prescribed for you as it was for the people before you? It's referring to the religions that came before Islam. So let's take a brief look into uh, religions that were there before Islam, such as uh, Hinduism. On holy occasions, many Hindus, and I'm not claiming to have extensive knowledge of Hinduism. This is just very uh, brief research I did for this presentation. Uh, in Hinduism, they fast on many uh, holy occasions. Also, on the 11th of every month, they fast. Uh, they, on the 11th of every month, they fast. And uh, the wife apparently can fast for, for their God to prolong their husband's life. Yeah, I said that right. right? Yeah, so the wives can fast for their husband to have a prolonged life. Uh, let's look at Christianity. We find many, uh, there's many similarities between Islam and Christianity. In the book of Exodus, we find that Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Again, in the book of Isaiah, uh, it says that don't fast for, for the people around you. Fasting is a worship between you and God. And in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse uh, 1, it says Jesus fasted for many days in order to have strength to fight off Satan. So again, we're saying fasting is prevalent in Christianity. But it doesn't stop there. We have fasting even in Judaism. Uh, in, there's a holiday by the name of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is, a day, is the day when Moses was able to free the children of Israel from Pharaoh. So they fast on that day to celebrate. And then uh, they have another thing called Tisha B'Av which is the day that the temple of Solomon, the prophet Suleiman, his temple was destroyed. And they fast to commemorate that. So what am I trying to say? Why am I telling you about all these uh, other religions? And that's to say Islam didn't come forth 1400 years ago to reject any religion. Islam came forth to confirm and renew. You know many people say Islam was the hybrid of all religions. It came forth, it's the newest one out of Christianity and Judaism. So it came forth, they took all the goods and then it made its own religion. I say, correction, Islam wasn't created 1400 years ago. Islam was the original. It was completed, com it was completed 1400 years ago. So what did Islam do? It came forth and it took the gray and it separated it into black and white. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So now we're talking about fasting, and we can look at it from many aspects. But right now we're going to look at the physiological aspects. What are the physical health benefits of me fasting? And by the way, I can go on hours upon hours telling you how good fasting is for your body. But I'd just like to briefly mention a few points that I found really, really interesting. Uh, whenever we fast, there's a protein in our brain that's released called brain-derived neurotrophic factors. Try saying that five times. Uh, or we can call it BDNF. BDNF. This protein, uh, apparently it interacts with the parts of a brain that regulate memory, learning, and higher cognitive function, which is uniquely exclusive to human beings. No other animals have these parts of the brain. So whenever we fast, these proteins begin to interact with these parts of the brain. And what do they do? Uh, they lengthen the, light of the, uh, the life of the brain cells, otherwise known as neurons, and they uh, stimulate the growth of newer neurons. New neurons. New neurons. Yeah. Newer neurons. <laughs> Uh, which is called neurogenesis. Uh, furthermore, when it comes to fasting, studies have shown that fasting, in fact, lowers chances of stroke, reduces chances of receiving brain trauma, uh, protection against Alzheimer's disease, and even slows down the progression of Huntington's disease. And for those of you who don't know what Huntington's and Alzheimer's is, it's whenever parts of the brain begin to degrade. Your brain cells begin to degrade, and either you begin to lose uh, cognitive function or you begin to lose your memories. Uh, so this, in fact, slows down the process. How many of you guys knew that? Not many, huh? How do you know that? MashaAllah. Okay. Uh, also, a lot of times people come forth and say, uh, you know, what if I have some uh, disease or something? Does fasting make it worse? Uh, in fact, in 1994, there was the international, in the International Congress of Health and Ramadan held in Casablanca, it entered 50 extensive studies where they showed fasting doesn't do, does it, not only does it improve your health, but since everyone's different, it showed no signs of worsening anyone's health. But then you ask the question, what about the diabetics? What about the cancer? Uh, in fact, it improves uh, cancer big, 
people who are suffering from cancer. But what about all these people? And it's so simple. If you're, if you're ill and you can't fast, Allah says in the Quran, uh, God wishes you convenient, uh, wishes for you convenience, not hardship, so that you may fulfill your obligations and glorify God for guiding you and express your appreciation. So if you're ill, you can basically make up for those days that you miss your fasts. But why does Allah prescribe it? You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He puts such a harsh punishment on fasting. You know, if we miss, if we willfully break a fast, you guys know the punishment is 60 consecutive days of fasting. Why is that? Why is it that we have to pay such a high zakat? Why, did, why is it that we have to free a slave if there's one available? Because Allah is your creator. And who better to know you than your creator? And some people say, you know, fasting is so good for my health, why can't I always fast? Uh, unfortunately, it's been shown that if people who have prolonged fasting experiences and caloric restrictions uh, are really grumpy, and really, really grumpy, uh, <laughs> you don't want to hang out with those people. But it's incredible that Allah has prescribed this one month for fasting. And by the way, I, was, uh, I just want to bring up a theory of how I possibly, my professor brought it up just this year. It's called the Proof of Genes Hypothesis. It's where a professor by the name of James Neal in the University of Michigan came forward with this theory where he says diabetes and obesity is on such a high rise. And he's noticed that it should have been weeded out by evolution a long time ago. Why is it that the dominant gene for diabetes is so prevalent? Isn't diabetes supposed to be the uh, isn't uh, evolution supposed to be the survival of the fittest? Why why is it that it stayed so long? Why why didn't natural selection weed it out? And then he proposed this theory that back then we used to be cavemen and we used to be hunters. So every now and then we hunt down a water buffalo and we'd have an era of mer merriment and we feast on it. But then we'd have no more food and we'd have to undergo a period of starvation. So whenever we go undergo this period of starvation, our body automatically adapts to it. So we have to store fat during this time when there is food. And whenever there's a period of starvation, I have to use the stored fat. So this uh, Dr. James Neal proposed this idea that, the, uh, that this was a broad... Allah He proposed this idea that it's been carried on throughout time. And this is the way our bodies have been naturally programmed. So after we eat, our body automatically goes into this starvation mode, where we're supposed to undergo a uh, time of starvation. However, that doesn't happen anymore. Unfortunately, we have something called a refrigerator, which we can have access to any time we want and eat and eat and eat. So whenever our body goes into that famine mode, we're still eating. So what he proposes, in order to reduce obesity, in order to reduce type 2 diabetes, we should undergo a period of starvation every now and then. So I tell you, which religion prescribes fasting for one month, where it's so obligated, and for you to miss out on that is a very deep punishment. That's incredible. I didn't know that. The minute he said that, the, thing, the first thing I was thinking about is from Allah. Wow. Allah knows us so well that He knows that we're going to cut corners if He doesn't put this uh, strictness on it. He knows that we're going to cut corners. So therefore, Allah says, you have to fast. I want you to fast. You need to fast. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Also, fasting uh, brings about another thing in our minds that, we, that a lot of times we get to, that a lot of times we forget. And that's something I like to call uh, appreciation from deprivation. You know, many a time, we don't know the worth of something until it's gone. You know, our parents, we don't know what they're worth until they're finally being eaten this way. So whenever we're fasting, we're deprived of so many things. We can't have water whenever we want. We can't have food whenever we want. And then, you know, the funny thing is, in America, people are dying of too much food. Yet in Africa, people are dying of too little food. So whenever we're fasting, and we can't have access to that, uh, to your favorite meal whenever you want it. You begin to think back, you know what? This is what people are going through all around the world. I have all of this, yet I don't even think a lot before I eat. I don't even think a lot after I eat. Look at what I'm living, look at this life. You know what I mean? This is what I mean by uh, appreciation through deprivation. 
And this comes into the soul aspect of Islam, where, uh, in fact, Salah Allah. Allah. So now we're talking about the soul, how does uh, fasting help our souls? And this is very, uh, this is defined very well by Imam Zain al Abidin Salawatullah wa Salamu Alayhi. He writes in Risalat al Bukhul, he writes, uh, The right of fasting is that you know that it is a veil that God has set up over your tongue over your ears, over your arms, your stomach, and your private parts. You should shield, uh, and to shield you from the fire. If you abandon fast, you will have torn God's veil away from yourself. I don't say Ramadan Kareem, Ramadan uh, merciful. It means Ramadan this month is such a mercy that for us to not want to fast, it's like tearing away God's veil from us. Saying, I don't want to take your blessing and take it. I don't want this. This is how it is. And uh, if we think back, we really look at all the crimes that have happened, it's due to a lack of self-control. Think about it. We have rape victims. We have uh, people who have killed people, uh, other people. In fact, I remember my sister was telling me where a dentist in Michigan found out that her husband was cheating on her. On him. Her husband was cheating on her. So he sedated her own husband and pulled out all his teeth when he was asleep. Can you imagine that? This is it through anger. You know, it's, funny, huh? it's not funny for the guy. But it happens. You know? uh, and whenever we talk about Ramadan, we're talking about our emotions being intact. We're talking about uh, being kind to each other for the sake of Allah. And by the way, whenever atheists ask you, you know what makes you so special? You know? Well, I, I eat the same thing you do. I sleep the same way you do. What makes you so special? That What, make, what do you have that I don't have? It's a very simple, it's a very simple answer. It's that your life revolves around yourself. Every action you do is for yourself. Whereas my life revolves, revolves around a greater being. It revolves around a God. Meaning I'm willing to step aside my anger for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning I'm willing to be kind to this person for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not because it makes me feel good and tingly on the inside. No, it's because I love, my, I love Allah and I know the value of my existence. Uh, so with that being said, whenever we... Do, uh, we we take part in the month of Ramadan when we're fasting. You know, we're, ha we're having all this control on ourselves. And then it, it begs the question in our brain that, you know, for 30 days I'm controlling myself. I'm, co I'm controlling this tongue from taking part in gossip. I'm controlling this tongue from swearing. I'm controlling this, uh, my body from doing certain things. Why can't I always control? If I can quit smoking for one month, why can't I always quit smoking? If I can abstain from sin, why can't I always abstain? And in fact, uh, it's been shown going back that blood sugar levels, whenever it's stabilized, which is which happens during fasting, ask any doctor or whatever they want to take a blood test, they make you fast. Because that's when your body's almost stable. Uh, whatever blood sugar levels is stable, your brain works at optimal. And that's why Allah has prescribed reading Quran. Your memory is working in like hyperdrive. Not only that, your uh, reading Quran in fact enhances your memory. How many people knew that? Knew that? <laughs> so I'm, the reason the, the reason behind this presentation was because I wanted to show you guys that you know what we have a lot that a lot of people don't have and we should appreciate it. And with that being said, I just like for everyone to take a few moments because Ramadan is right around the corner. It's uh, three, 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 three. It's coming up, and I want you guys to reflect for a second and ask yourself: This month of Ramadan that's coming up, what am I going to do? Am I going to sleep through it and hope it passes as soon as possible? Because it's my summertime, I can do that. Or am I going to use this month to better myself? You know, it's the birthday of Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. Salaam alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi wa Allah, Muhammad wa alayhi wa Muhammad wa Muhammad. And it's a time when we're remembering such a great individual. You know, Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. We call him the stranger of Karbala when no one else was with him. But who's more of a stranger than Imam Hussein? Does anyone know who's more of a stranger than Imam Hussein? It's none other than Imam Mahdi. You want to know why? Because Imam Hussein had someone like Abul Fadl al Abbas. Imam Hussein had someone like Ali al Akbar. Imam Hussein had a wife like Rabab. He had a daughter like Rabia. He had a sister like Zain, uh, sister, uh, Sayyid Zain. Are you and I Abbas? Brothers? Sisters? 
you think you're uh, Zaina? Who are we for Imam Mahdi? We dare say a, a Jafia a that we're nowhere near? How can we possibly be ready when we're not ready on the inside? And I stress upon this. Let's, brothers and sisters, let's take a few moments to think about this Ramadan that's coming up. How are we going to use this? How are we going to use this month to better ourselves? How are we going to use this month to ready ourselves from Imam, for Imam Mahdi as well? Allahu ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala.